moral theory cannot critique economists' descriptions of economic action. It has no competence to do it. But it can perhaps hold up to examination some of the concepts in which economics customarily refers to action, human action in general terms. And so I am taking the occasion of this discussion of egoism, greed, and sin to explore a proposition which is often treated as a truism of classical economics, that self-interest is necessary in order to motivate action. Now, all practical motivation, not only economic motivation, seems to imply self-interest in two clear respects. First, we have an interest in the good we pursue, which must indirectly be a self-interest. To be interested in a thing is to acknowledge that bearing, the bearing of that thing upon oneself, and to be interested in a good is to be engaged by it, not simply as good in itself, as when we might say, Beethoven's very good, but I don't really care for him, but as good for me too. So, even in conferring goods upon another, I see the other person's advantage as being of some important concern to me. Whenever we repeat the saying which um, the present Pope has recently been doing, that caring for the poor is not only a duty of mercy but of justice, what we're saying is that we have to rule out the thought of a generosity that is an absolute donation, all good flowing from us to them, with no context of wider common goods to make that flow necessary and intelligible. Justice is a good in which we too are inevitably interested. So we have, as it were, the self-interest of the me too, not me alone, but me like everybody else involved in the good. And then in the second place, we have an interest in the exercise of our own agency. And agency is incurably self-reflective. We cannot act thoughtfully and considerately without caring about doing so. Augustine frequently observes that to love a thing is also to love our love for it. What we strive for is also something we are to become in relation to. So in striving, we strive also for ourselves. Now, these two reflexive forms of self-interest, which are more or less inherent in decision and action, are not, obviously enough, a sufficient condition for decision and action. There must also be an object of decision and action. They are also not what is normally meant by self-interest in the discussion of economics. And that is precisely why it's worth being quite clear about them. Because it is the reflexive forms of these self-interests that makes the proposition that self-interest is necessary appear an irresistible proposition. The truism, if I am to seek a thing, there must be an I who am to seek it, is indeed irresistible. But it involves no decisions at all as to what I am to seek. Now, the sleight of hand uh, is, if I may call it that, is to get other things to ride upon that self-evident self-interest things which are in themselves far from self-evident. 
If, for example, we introduce into the picture of self-interest uh, the notion of an agent's preference with its implications of an object to be selected from a range of comparable objects, a series of possible outcomes, then we are getting something to ride upon the notion uh, that is not only not self-evident, but is actually quite counterintuitive. Because in most decisions, there is no set of possibilities, equipossible, equi-eligible, equidetermate, that exists prior to the decision itself. Or if we introduce with the word preference a notion that all our criteria are wholly future-looking and that backward-looking reasons for action are excluded, backward-looking actions which are needed, if we are to judge an object actually worthy of preference, then again we introduce a non-self-evident element into the self-reference. And so, thirdly, if we posit an agent self that is not <coughs> continuous with itself over time from past to future, an air of loyalties and commitments, but simply a pinpoint deciding moment, an empty will to impose order. Now, a self-interest reworked on those terms can only be an interest in self-assertion, the act of imposing preference in itself and for its own sake. And so then we can confront two alternative concepts of self-interest. One necessary to reflective deliberation, the other willful and assertive. There is, on the one hand, a necessary self-interest in the communication of goods. There is, on the other, a willful self-interest in competition for goods. The one posits the other agent as an economic partner in communication. The other posits the other economic agent as a rival. Now, I want to take those two stereotyped and somewhat uh, matchstick-like descriptions of concepts of self-interest and unpack a little more flexibly each of them in turn. In using the term communication, and speaking of an interest in communication, I'm drawing on a favorite word of St. Paul, koinonia, which is translated variously, community, communion, <coughs> communication. To communicate is to hold something in common, to make it a common possession, to treat it as ours rather than as either yours or mine. The partners to a communication form a community, a we, in relation to some object that they share, which may be a material good, so that communication is charitable giving or arms, uh, or maybe something else. The church is supremely called the communication of the Holy Spirit, and the shared spirit is the ground for sharing everything else in the spirit. Now this term communication had a particularly important resonance for the 14th century English scholastic John Wycliffe, whom I used to annoy my Oxford colleagues horribly by referring to regularly as the greatest figure ever to do theology at Oxford, because, of course, none of them had read anything of him. Um, Wycliffe drew from this idea a distinctive idea of lordship, dominium, which did not depend on property. Property was, he said, lordship without communication on equal terms. It was what we might call absolute property. That is um, 
the possession of something with no attendant obligation to anyone else in respect of what, something that was one's own. But God's own lordship was not exercised by keeping his own to himself. It was exercised, Wycliffe insisted, by communication. Nothing was more characteristic of God than, he said, to lend. Not to give away, because God cannot alienate his lordship of any created thing, but bringing human beings into fellowship with him in the disposition of all that he had made. And God had done this universally, sharing creation as a whole with mankind as a whole, and that is why we can have an interest in anything whatever. But that interest depends on a responsiveness to the original divine communication. So in Wycliffe's most famously controversial thesis, any and every righteous man is lord of the whole sense-perceptible world. And in receiving anything, we receive the whole world with it. Communicating the goods of creation with each other, we discover, not posit, but discover a radical equality in our creaturely relationship to God's communication. None of us is the source of our communications to others. All of us hold whatever we communicate uh, from Christ's communication. The logic of communication is summed up in this formula, this mine is ours. St. Luke's statement of how the early church practiced community was that there was one heart and soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. Now, that did not deny the reality of property as a relative uh, factor. Christians had things that belonged to them. But they interpreted that belonging as a resource for their mutual communications. They saw their property not as their own, but as common not as mine, but as ours. Now, over against that, I take the principle of competition to be the denial of some non-communicable resource to an economic rival. Now, there must be competitive transactions wherever there is scarcity. But if competition is not elevated into a principle of economic activity, it may, when it arises, be put to the service of a higher principle, which is that of freer communications. The enthroning of competition as a principle, with the posit that the scarcity of resources is the universal condition of all our exchanges, offers, I think, a key to the interpretation of economic sin. And as that is part of what we are to discuss in this session, I say a word about that. We sometimes think of economic sin as simply greed or excessive consumption. And we point out, as was pointed out very well yesterday, that though every living thing has an interest in consuming what it needs for its life, it has no interest at all in indefinite consumption. Uh, and excesses of consumption can militate against sustaining life. This is perfectly true. What it does not say, however, is that the wide scope of economic sin beyond the bounds of consumption and the problem of sin as accumulation or acquisition. The scholastic distinction between the two powers of property, consumption and disposal, has the virtue at least of reminding us that there are temptations in more than one direction at this point. And when we speak of sin as greed, we're likely to think in terms of a kind of multimedia gluttony consuming all the world's material goods, uh, 
with an appetite like an unbridled appetite for food and drink. But many of the sins that most concern us are not at all like that, but resemble far more what was meant by the Greek pleonexia, the acquisition of more, amassing resources simply to withhold them. Capitalist enterprise has often, in fact, been associated with austerity of consumption. I think of those beautiful, radiating, narrow streets of the 18th century merchant houses in Bordeaux, so modest in their frontage that at first glance one can mistake them for Victorian workers' row houses till you look close up and see the exquisite materials and perfect workmanship, all designed to communicate economic power carefully held in reserve, held back. The classic form of the sin of acquisitiveness is the preoccupation with owning things, whether as de facto ownership, as simple possession, or de jure ownership as right of property. To own is to exclude the economic partner, and on this Pope Francis's comments have been memorable. For some goods, exclusion serves a necessary intermediate function. Material goods, quantitatively limited, dispersed when they're shared, require some accumulation as a condition for sharing them effectively, whether by gift or exchange. But not all and not the most important communications require ownership, and many are likely to be hindered by it. I claim and confer no ownership whatever in the thoughts I am so freely distributing to you in the course of these remarks. A nurse who cares for the sick, a householder who gives a meal to a mendicant friar, these make no transfer of ownership. And repeated attempts to reconstruct education, health care, social welfare, on the basis of the sort of transfer of ownership that is typical for manufacture and retail, have had, frankly, socially bizarre results. And as the scope of ownership is not universal, so neither is the scope of exchange. Exchange serves the communication of consumable and material goods, the relative value of which is capable of meaningful monetary quantification. Money floats on the choppy sea of social conditions which are, in the end, simply an aspect of mortality. And prominent in the teaching of Jesus is the parable of the rich fool who did not realize the limits that mortality set upon the power to exchange and consume. Cultural, spiritual goods which cannot be priced with any exactness and typically take generations to mature, do need other models of social communication. And, for example, endowment, which will simply have to have a place in any developed economy which is thinking of, over the longer term. Augustine liked to quote a line from an ancient comedy, you all want to buy cheap and sell dear. Is that the whole truth of markets? Well, a second-hand book dealer the other day refused to buy from me because he wasn't certain how valuable my book was. And he said this, uh, I wouldn't want to offer you five pounds and possibly cheat you. An elegant excuse, perhaps, but quite a plausible one, because he wanted to buy something he could sell with a comfortable markup. That's his business, isn't it? But it's also his business not to want a hugely disproportionate profit by accident that uh, perhaps puts a question mark by his judgment. Exchange is a social matter. It's conducted in a community of buyers and sellers. Mutual trust and reliable judgment count for a great deal. My dealer had his standing to maintain, 
And that was his real economic interest at that point. He didn't want it getting around that he'd ripped me off by 1,000%. We like to get our citrus fruits on special, but not so special as to close the supermarket down. We have an interest in doing just as well as the market can bear, but not better, for we have a real long-term interest in the stability of economic communications. We want to have trading partners who can survive. And deeper still, we have a real long-term interest in justice uh, pervading economic as well as other spheres of activity. And when we encounter people who do not identify with those wants, we come to the conclusion that they're making a serious mistake about the nature of economic activity as such, about their own economic interests, and about their own humanity and its wider conditions of flourishing. What gives rise to the sickness of pleonexia or acquisitiveness. One of two things, I think, both of them existential ills to which our flesh is heir. One is the indeterminacy of danger, which presents itself to us as a diffuse and generalized anxiety. The other is the indeterminacy of agency, which presents itself to us as a diffuse and generalized ambition without a definite place in the world or a definite project. Not to be able to see the goods behind the immediate good, not to be able to perceive each good as a form of communication with a definite source and a content is the snare in which we are taken when we are caught up in these indeterminate horizons. The communicative potential of each good can only be laid hold of as we receive the great communication offered to us by God with himself and with one another. It is an aspect of the failure which theologians call unbelief. Thank you.